Good morning, everyone. It looks like the party was pretty fun last night. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about teaching with Code Cosmos. Well, how did I get here? So I've been using computers for a very long time, at least relative to my life. I've been using computers since before I could read. But I've been using them professionally since about 1997. Uh, since then, I founded a company and had a successful exit. And I ended up with a normal job by accident. And it turned out that I just wasn't passionate about it anymore. And here's an example of one of the computers that I used before I could read. The, this is an old Zenith portable computer that my grandfather had. I think it weighed about 50 pounds, but it had a handle. And this is the game that taught me how to read. This was King's Quest I by Sierra. You see at the bottom there, there's a little greater than sign. You had to type sentences to tell the character what to do. I wanted to play it by myself, so I had my parents teach me how to read and write. So no longer being passionate about what I was doing, I needed to find a new mission. I wanted to do some social good, not just make money. My last company did advertising. So why not education? I know how to teach myself programming. Can I teach others? Here's a nice quote that I like from good old Dijkstra. It does not suffice to hone your own intellect. That will join you to your grave. You must teach others how to hone theirs. And so to find inspiration, I thought I would go to some conferences. This was a really fun conference called EG. EG is basically the continuation of the TED conference. Although less focused on changing the world, more about getting really interesting people together. And most importantly, people that aren't all in the tech industry. And so at EG7, I met some wonderful people. And one of those people was the COO of the college initiative. And I'll get to that in a minute. One of the other people was somebody that worked at JPL. This is me getting a tour of JPL, standing right by Curiosity. And so the College Initiative. The College Initiative is a nonprofit program for high school students in a very poor area of the United States. It's a summer program that helped them prepare for college because the local school doesn't do a good enough job. And so Kat proposed to me, why not open their minds to programming? give them a little break from trying to improve their test scores and write college applications. So I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never taught a class before, certainly not an introductory class to high school students. I'd given talks to programmers at conferences, and I've sort of mentored people by accident, people that worked with me or people that, that I worked with on open source projects. So I had to figure out what I was doing, and I only had a few months to do it. So because I had no idea what I was doing, I, I looked around to see if I could use a service to help me. So I found Khan Academy had a code teaching tool. And uh, Code Academy was also available, but it had some technical issues. I, I wanted to teach students how to do something interesting, how to make graphics on the page. So Code Academy had a nice system for doing text-based programming that, that was very safe and ran in a web worker. And then they had a service for doing jQuery program, which was very unsafe. And you also had to learn jQuery and HTML and CSS and all those things to do anything interesting with it. So could I make it work? Nope. Turns out that in this region of the United States, and especially in the summer, you can't rely on internet connectivity every day. So I wasn't able to use an online service. And also, the, the Khan Academy program uh, wasn't available open source either. So I wasn't able to just leverage somebody else's code. So I needed a plan to build something. And I didn't have very long to do it at all. And I, my, my requirements are that I needed it to work without internet, but I also wanted it to work online. If the students wanted to continue with their projects at home, I wanted them to be able to just log in and continue their work. And I also didn't want to install anything, because a computer lab in the summer doesn't have an administrator. So I needed to have just a platform that, that I can uh, run the software from. So I could depend on Chrome. I could get them to install that during, during the school year before the summer. So that was my, my platform. And well, what language can I teach? Well, JavaScript is really the only viable in-browser language, especially at that time. 
perhaps there, there are scheme variants or closure or, or coffee script and something like that. But the, the truth is the error messages aren't very good. And most of them aren't self-hosted. You need some server that, that will do all the compilation and such for them. I wanted it to be very self-contained. And actually, so it could run offline. And I really just couldn't do better, given only a few weeks to build the tool. And so in order to make it interesting to the students, I wanted to have them interact with the canvas. On the canvas, they can have text and animation and graphics, because strings aren't interesting to, today, to, to today's students. When, when I was growing up, it was fascinating to, to write a, a loop in BASIC that would just print the same string over and over again, because computers didn't do much in those days. But today's students are used to very high-end games, and that's simply not appealing to them. So I saw that Khan Academy used processing.js, and I had friends that had taught classes to art students and other non-programmers with processing. I couldn't find a similar library that did, did a better job, so I decided to use processing.js. And so for the code editor, at first I looked at Ace, because that's what Khan Academy used. But CodeMirror also had a lot of street cred, because WebKit's inspector uses it. And looking at both of them side by side, I found CodeMirror's examples simply easier to understand. And CodeMirror turned out to work great. So here's what it looks like. Um, I'm sorry, the text is a little small. This is a screenshot. So on the left side, it's just a code editor. And on the right side is the canvas. And there's no compile and run step. It simply runs the code whenever the syntax checks. And so because JavaScript has a difficult syntax, I had to build linting in. Fortunately, CodeMirror shipped with an example to go ahead and just use JS, JS hint. But unfortunately, the example runs JS hint in the same context as the editor. So it turns out that it can lag when you type. So I moved it to a web worker for performance reasons, which was actually quite easy. CodeMirror is pretty well factored. So JavaScript. Well, problem is, JavaScript sandboxing really isn't a thing. You have web workers, but web workers can't actually do anything on their own. They can only send messages. And I was using processing.js, which requires the JavaScript code to be running in the same browser context as the canvas. And you might think, hey, iframes have a little bit of sandboxing, but it turns out they don't execute concurrently because they can interface with the same DOM on the same page. So you can't really use iframes to get around this sort of problem, because the students can very easily accidentally write a for loop or a while loop that doesn't terminate, and then they have to reload the page and lose their work or, or whatever. So how can I cheat? It turns out I can sort of interpret JavaScript. And the way I did that is any time there was a function call or a loop iteration, I would increment a counter. And if that counter gets too big, I would simply abort the JavaScript. And the way I implemented that is I would parse the JavaScript with this prima, transform it with S reverse to insert those cheats, and then write back out the JavaScript code with ES code gen. And then I could simply eval it directly, not in a web worker. And so here, here's how that looks in the application. I, I'm sorry it's a little difficult to see here. But uh, you can see some of the lines are, are highlighted in red. And the lines highlighted in red are the stack trace of, of where the code executed for too long. And this is actually an example that, that uh, would crash, crash uh, Khan Academies, because this loop terminates, th this goes into an infinite loop based on a random number. So there's runs it once in a web worker and then just runs it in the canvas. And so th this would freeze up Khan Academy, but I was able to prevent that failure by inserting all of this code. And here's an example of what it actually looks like. So we have here WTF, which is a function that infinitely calls for each on an array. And this is what it turns into. It's quite a bit of code given the input is only four lines, and then you have all of this. So the first thing is I turn on use strict, because I want JavaScript to have a little bit better semantics than it does by default. And then I wrap everything in this catch errors function. And what that does is it turns exceptions into something that I can display on the screen. 
And then I wrap all of their code in, in a function called user code. The dollar sign after it actually maps to the line numbers in the input. So when I display the exceptions, I can show them where in their program the error happened. And I also wrap that, that WTF closure. And at the beginning of that closure, I simply have this counter variable. And if it increments the max counter, then I turn continue to false, and I throw an error. And then at the bottom, I call it. And the reason I need to set continue to false is because the code in this application executes once per frame. So setting continue to false tells it to stop executing at all. And here's all the random open source web technologies that I was able to leverage for this project. Uh, I chose AngularJS, uh, mostly because I'd been hearing a lot about it, and I wanted to try it out. My previous experience was with older web frameworks, such as uh, jQuery or MochiKit, which I wrote a long, long time ago. And I wanted to use some custom fonts, because I was writing this on Mac, but we were running it on Windows, and I wanted to look consistent, and I wanted to look a little nicer than, than the default sans serif. So I couldn't use any of the Google web APIs or anything, because I couldn't depend on the internet working. And I wanted to load things asynchronously and get notified when the load happened, so that the, the application would load quickly, even if they were using it from home. So it turned out that I was able to leverage Font.js to do that. I did use a little bit of jQuery, because I initially prototyped it in jQuery, and some of the code that I was using still used jQuery. But uh, if I were to clean this up, I would probably just make that all Angular-based. I used JS zip tools to allow the students to download a copy of all their code. And I used underscore, because I really like functional programming. And so for persistence, because I wanted the students to be able to not only use this in, in the lab, but also at home, so I used CouchDB on the, on the server, and I used PouchDB on the client. PouchDB is basically a very small CouchDB that works in um, the browser's offline storage. So when they're working, all they're saving is going directly to the machine that they're using. The server doesn't need to be up or available. It'll simply synchronize changes when there is a connection. But for this model to work, you need per-user databases in CouchDB. And it turns out CouchDB doesn't do that. So I hacked together something really quick in, in Node, uh, because there were good Node libraries for CouchDB, such that when a new account is created, it would simply create a database for that user. And here's, here's what it looks like with the persistence. There's just a pull down with all of the things that are saved. And so for build tools, I use pretty vanilla stuff for JavaScript. I used Grunt and Bower. And for CSS and fonts, I used uh, pure CSS, because I wanted to try that out. I used Font Awesome, because it gave me great uh, icons that scale. Uh, Contrapunct Bold uh, for the Code Cosmos logo. Source Code Pro for the editor. And Ubuntu Regular for the menu. And uh, this is Twitter's login screen, which I very liberally copied to make my login screen. Uh, it's very difficult to see here, but that background, I use satellite imagery from Hubble. And, and it, it'll actually pick a random one every time you, you go to the front page. And so hosting, the, the first version of hosting was just on my laptop. And that's actually what we turned out to use in the lab, because we didn't have internet all, all the days. And then version one, I didn't want any server-side code if I could avoid it, because Administering servers is, is a lot of work, even for a small service. And so all of the web content was hosted on GitHub pages. I used Irish Couch for, for the database. And I used Nojitsu to run that little database creation script. It worked OK. And so when, when I would come home back to the hotel every night, I would simply synchronize all the databases from my local couch to this Irish Couch so that the students could see their work at home. And so version two, well, after I got back, Rackspace had this great program where they offered free hosting uh, in their cloud to open source projects. So I contacted Jesse, and he gave me an account. So I got to get rid of all this node stuff. I simply wrote a custom Erlang module for, well, simply wrote a custom Erlang module for Couch to create these databases. And I got rid of all the external dependencies. It was simply Couch and static files, and that was it, much simpler. And here's a little bit about 
the program. This was a, a picture of us the first day. Uh, that newspaper is actually not even online because it was such a small town. But they've been, they've been running that newspaper since 1872. <laughs> so the school we did this at was Lee County Senior High in Arkansas. There was no cell coverage, no internet connectivity. And although I had considered not having internet connect connectivity, I was writing this code down to the minute, and I wasn't quite prepared. But fortunately, I had local copies of everything I needed. So I thought I'd have time to tweak the curriculum, but I ended up having to troubleshoot getting everything working. At first, I tried using Python simple HTTP server, uh, but it turns out simple HTTP server wants to do reverse DNS requests so it can show pretty log messages. So simple HTTP server doesn't work in an environment without any internet connectivity. But fortunately, I had written a web server before, so I just started up Mochi Web, and that turned out to work okay. And here's some evidence that I've been using computers a long time. And this is some video evidence of the first time that, that I ever did a presentation. Can we get audio from the laptop, please? I was hoping to be able to click that. Showing the color graphics, um, running an OS2 demo under the DOS mode. I'm demoing a PS2 Model 90. I loaded it up with Windows games and a couple DOS games, and I'm just showing the kids what a computer with OS2 can do. I learned to use a computer from my grandfather. He had a couple King's Quest games, and that's how I learned to read, too. And then my dad got a computer, and, I, and he told me a couple of the DOS commands, and I just picked it up and started using it. IBM is one of the greatest exhibits at Old Town Day. I think people look forward to uh, seeing what's new and high technology. Uh, the kids love the giveaways, the posters, and uh, the other items that uh, IBM has graciously offered today. Um, it shows that uh, a business... Okay, and here's some screenshots of some of the lessons that I did. The first lesson that I had them do in order to learn the coordinate system was to simply write their name with with lines. And of course, after a long day of my first teaching, I had to get a drink. And here's, here's me helping a student debug their program. I don't, unfortunately, the, these pictures really don't show up very well, uh, <laughs> washed out like this. Another very interesting uh, example in the curriculum was having them draw the Olympic rings. So this is a tricky problem because the rings overlap in a way such that you can't simply draw them in order. And uh, the, the first day, I was uh, very tired and jet lagged, and I, I didn't remember to tell them everything they needed to know to solve the problem. So if you ever teach a class, make sure that you know how to solve the problem and you give them all the tools that they need to solve the problem, or else it'll be very frustrating for them. But the next day, I, I was able to, to uh, figure out what I had done wrong. And I gave them everything they needed to know to, to solve the problem. And they, they were all very excited. And then I had some barbecue, because we were in the South, and it's delicious. <laughs> and I, I showed some, some interesting videos from, from uh, the past. I wanted to show them where computers came from. Can we get audio again, please? Ohio's Case Institute. Oh, thanks, Chrome. Ohio's Case Institute of Technology won only six out of 16 games last year. So this season, Don Knuth, student mathematician, used an electronic computer to evaluate each player's performance. Here's how he did it. During scrimmage, Knuth builds a performance record of each player, noting everything from baskets to fumbles. This data is put on punched cards and fed to an IBM computer capable of making 50,000 calculations a minute. Coach Phil Heim checks the computer's rating of each player's performance. At an actual game, 
he refers to the computer's findings as his strategy changes. Does the system work? Coach Heim thinks so. His team won 11 out of 14 games so far this year. And here's some, some more pictures of me with the students. This is us going to a blues club to unwind afterwards. And catfish, because we're in the south. And another interesting thing that I did is I, I brought some reference books to the class, uh, some reference books that had some information about JavaScript and processing. And uh, th this is my signed copy of Nature of Code. Uh, and at the end of the class, I offered the students uh, to do a raffle. And quite a few of the students decided uh, that, that they wanted to participate. And some of them went home with some of these books. So I think I connected with a few of the students such that they were at least interested enough to take some books home. And this is me in the class. As you see, these aren't, these aren't typical programmers. There's a little more than half women and most, mostly minorities. The ones that aren't minorities are mostly teachers. And this is the wonderful thank you card that I got from the students. This pretty much made it worth it. And again, another drink. This was after everything was done. It was very relaxing. And of course, fried chicken, because we're in the South. And so what's next? Well, I've been spending a lot of time lately helping out with a website called exorcism.io. Uh, exorcism is, is kind of like a 99 problems or, or etudes site where there's a lot of simple programming exercises that, that people can uh, solve. But the interesting thing about exorcism.io is that it's collaborative. So when you, when you post your solution to an exercise, somebody else that has completed that exercise or many people that have completed that exercise can give you code review, which I think is a lot more effective than solving problems by yourself. It's kind of like going to a classroom, except it's all online. And I'm also looking to do some more volunteering. I'll probably do some local stuff. And I'm still looking for inspiration. I haven't quite figured out exactly what I want to commit myself to yet, but I'm having a lot of fun teaching and helping out and doing more open source. And if you have any ideas, I would definitely love to hear them. And so thank you. Uh, the slides are available online, and the source for the slides are online as well, and you can Feel free to email me or contact me on Twitter. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. We have a bunch of time for questions. So any questions? Great talk, first of all. Thank you. Uh, at Prezi, we also did a, a sort of mentorship program where we're very dis uh, Privileged kids came uh, from the countryside uh, every weekend, and we do a JavaScript course on code, codehs.com. And we we uh, were okay with it, but there were a number of ways we would have improved it. But of course, we can't because it's not we don't have the source to it. Are you publishing the source that you used for your your uh, class anywhere? Ah, great question. I, I had intended to add this to the slide, um, but. Yes, I created a GitHub organization called Code Cosmos, and all the sources there. Rock, awesome. It, it's not great code, but I, I would be happy to help clean that up if you intend to use it. Very cool, thanks. Um, hi. So you mentioned using Pure and uh, Font Awesome. Why didn't you start with whole CSS? Like, why do you use a framework while they could also learn CSS? Uh, so I used a framework uh, because it helped me organize the CSS. Uh, I, I'm simply not a CSS expert, so um, because it, it styled some of the things that I wanted nicely, and it had like the nice menu layout, and, and it was able to make it very easy to divide it into two panes. That, that's basically why I used a framework, simply uh, so I didn't have to figure out exactly how to do it. And eventually, I, I would like to fix up the code so that it works cross-browser. And uh, writing CSS by hand uh, can be challenging cross-browser. Um, so that, that's basically why I used uh, Pure. Uh, for Font Awesome, I mean, it's, it's really just a font. And I, I couldn't be bothered to, to draw icons. And uh, you wouldn't want to see them if I did. Uh, when you're teaching a student, what do you 
find that it's more effective to tell him like there is many ways to do this or this is the best I mean this is a good way to do it so in this case I wasn't really prescribing uh, the best way I, I was simply giving them uh, some examples of how how you can do those drawing commands how you can do loops and functions and stuff like that and uh, I was simply giving that giving it to them as a challenge and I wanted them uh, to essentially discover programming for themselves, and I wanted the students to help each other. I, I wasn't trying to uh, teach them good computer science. I was simply trying to get them excited about computers and programming as a, a potential field of study for them when they go to college. You mentioned using AngularJS, but you did not say how your experience was. Uh, so, AngularJS, uh, I, I think that the reactive data binding model is a great model. Uh, I think that Angular might not have the best implementation of said model, but I was able to get it work, to work, and it certainly saved me a lot of code relative to a jQuery and or um, uh, a solution using the, the older styles where, where you have to make everything explicit. Uh, and my experience with Ember in the past was that uh, it didn't work, but I guess I tried it too early. I, I simply wasn't willing to, to take the risk again when I, I had startups that I'm advising and people that I know uh, that said that, that Angular is great. So I, I'd pretty much committed to, to doing it just by social cues. Hi, thanks for the talk. I love hearing about how um, from, from the volunteer side and also sort of how schools interpret opportunities for this kind of exposure. And I'm interested in, so if you can, maybe if, if you can infer what the, the school's perspective was on what, how they decided to, to, to even make this happen, what sort of follow-up they intended to have with the students. Um, are, there, are there teachers in the school who are, be, you know, getting training to, to do some of this stuff themselves? Or just what is sort of the big picture for the school? Okay, so uh, this actually had very little to do with the school or the local school system. It was uh, with the nonprofit, the college initiative program. So we were in a school uh, because the school gave them the space to do this program, but it, it wasn't really part of the school. They weren't normal school teachers. I mean, many of the volunteers were school teachers during the year, but they, they weren't necessarily teachers at that school. Um, so there, there has been a little bit of follow-up. I created a, a mailing list for the students, and uh, I, I've given them some, some interesting links. And I gave them a final project, uh, such that if they make uh, a program that has cool output, uh, then I would get it printed on a t-shirt for them. And a, a few of the students um, did participate in that, so I've had a few shirts printed, uh, but the percentage was a little bit lower than I liked. Uh, but I wasn't entirely prepared for it. It was an idea that I came up with um, like midway through the second to last day. So they didn't have a lot of time to finish it in class. Uh, and a lot of them are very busy working like two or three jobs and going to school and taking care of their family, like that kind of stuff. Um, they, they've got pretty hard lives for, for 17 year olds. This isn't a question. You mentioned that uh, you're looking for projects to do, and it just kind of struck me during this conversation uh, after your talk that if, if uh, it wouldn't have been for Prezi, I wouldn't have been involved in mentoring kids because I wouldn't have gone and done it on my own, and it's awesome that you did, but I think there are many people like me who, who kind of want to do it, and, and after doing it, feel really good about it, but, but there's just that, that spark that's required to get them started, and if, if you did something that kind of became a resource that people can use to organize this or people who are really into the whole volunteering thing but they don't have the programming skills to kind of approach people who do have the skills and would like to teach but need that extra push. I think that would be a lot of leverage there. So you could, you could get a lot accomplished kind of with that second degree thing. That's just an idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I was in the same boat as you. Like, uh, at the time uh, I left Facebook, I, I was basically doing research, like, what can I do for education? And I, I simply wasn't doing anything. 
but when I met the, the COO for the college initiative, she's like, you should do this. And I was like, well, I don't know how, I don't know if I can do it. And she was like, listen, you should do this. And essentially because I, I, I'm on sabbatical or whatever, I didn't have a good enough excuse not to do it. So, <laughs> so, so that's how I got into it. Like somebody had to leverage me, essentially. I, I, I didn't have enough of a spark to make it happen on my own. Any more questions? Well, then, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Thank you.